Welcome to my channel. Think happy be happy. Subscribe. Like. A Sudden Swirl of Icy Wind Chapter 3 It was a puzzle to test even a genie's powers. And I, alas, was trapped in my bottle under the tamarind tree. But Captain Fluke was a resourceful man, and he who must face the terrors of tides and rocks and angry seas must learn courage and quick wits. So when the captain heard the doctor's story, he stood and rattled the bars of the prison, and shouted for the guard. Take me to the caliph, he roared. Why, laughed the guard. Is your body in such a hurry to say farewell to your head? Take me to the caliph, roared the captain again. Or it will be your head rolling over stones, not mine. I have sailed across a dozen seas to bring the caliph a cure for his weakness. A cure for the caliph's weakness. The whisper ran around the prison walls. He brings a cure across a dozen seas. William looked up. I bet the guard took him to the caliph pretty sharpish once he heard that. Mustafa agreed. So fast the captain barely saw the chambers of polished black marble through which he was hurried. And, finally, he stood before the caliph. What did the caliph say? Hardly a word. The caliph lay on a sofa of the finest brocade. Too weak to raise head finger, he simply whispered, Give me the cure. Alas, said the captain, I cannot give it to you, for the cure is the key of good health, and it lies buried in your palace garden. Send for it quickly, whispered the caliph, for I am weak almost to death. Alas, said the captain, the key to good health cannot be found by another. The one who digs for it, and finds it, takes the cure. The caliph lay back, exhausted and disappointed, as his last hopes drained from his face. But the captain had quite as much to lose as the caliph in this matter, so he stepped forward. Come, he said in the voice that had soothed many a ship's boy through his first tempest. Let us go in the garden and look for the key. And did he go? Trembling, the caliph took the weight of his body on his own feet for the first time in his life. As he stepped forward, resting on the captain's arm, the slippers of silver tissue fell away in shreds. Barefoot, he shuffled weakly down the marble steps, into the garden. And there the captain took a spade from the hand of an astonished gardener, and handed it to the caliph. Dig. Where? asked the caliph, spilling hot tears in his weakness. The garden is huge. Where shall I find this key of good health? Alas, nobody knows. But, cried the horrified caliph, I might dig the whole garden before I find it. He turned to the captain, but the captain simply bowed his head, and stood in silence. And so, slowly, and sadly, the caliph lifted the heavy spade and let it drop in the earth. Slowly and sadly he bore his weight down on the handle, lifting a clod of dry earth. Slowly and sadly he bent over and sifted through it. Nothing, he said. Try again, begged the captain in the voice that had encouraged many a ship's boy up the highest mast. And, strengthened, the caliph dug, once, twice, three times until the captain said, Enough. Let us rest. The key of good health will not disappear. We'll dig again tomorrow. William was grinning hugely. Brilliant, he interrupted Mustafa. Brilliant? And did the caliph go out and dig the garden every day? Mustafa chuckled in turn. Every day for a whole month. And every morning he asked the captain, Shall we find the key of good health today? And every morning the captain replied, Perhaps, if we dig deep enough and long enough and the caliph got stronger, and stronger. The weakness dripped from him as from a melting rose sherbet. His flabby arms grew muscled and strong. His soft belly vanished. His legs grew wiry and brown. Some days he dug for hours and, in the sheer pleasure of digging, forgot the key. 
and the captain didn't remind him. Not for a moment. The captain lolled on the steps of the fountain, sipping lush wines and trying to decide if Fatima, the jewel of the harem, would make a sailor's wife. Sometimes, watching the caliph dig, he felt his own muscles weakening from disuse, and, leaping up, he'd try to wrestle the spade from the caliph's hand. Wrestle it. Indeed, yes. The caliph had become a strong man with all his digging. Not wishing to give up the spade, he'd wrestle back. And the two men might struggle. Happily for hours over one spade, till one day the grand vizier tired of the sight and, without thinking, sent for another. As soon as the caliph saw it, he cried, What? Another spade? But then the captain might be the lucky man who finds the key of good health. Sovereign of the faithful, said the grand vizier, shaking his head. Do you not know that you do not need the key any longer? The caliph stared at the grand vizier in amazement. Then he looked down at his strong lean arms and his firm legs, and tears of happiness sprang in his eyes, and he turned to Captain Fluk the adventurer. Ask me for anything, he said. And, promptly, the captain answered, Give me a ship, a wife, and that old green bottle that lies under the tamarind tree in the courtyard beside the great mosque. And so the caliph let him go. He was a man of honor. He kept his word. And the three of you sailed off. We all sailed off. The captain sailed proudly bathed in the heartfelt praises and grateful blessings of all the caliph's people. Fatima sailed with her eyes tightly closed, pale as a grub, leaning over the ship's rail. And I lay, greener than mist, inside the sea chest on a bed of the finest brocade. That rotten sacking. It is past its best. Why didn't the captain let you out of the bottle? You could have helped poor Fatima. Mustafa smiled. The captain had learned his lesson. A gift given brings very little and does not last. A gift earned brings more, and lasts a lifetime. Fatima opened her eyes after a week, and saw the dolphins wheeling and leaping in the high. His wonders in the deep. Green seas. Mustafa bowed his head. Lakum dinukum wa lidini, he murmured. To you your religion, and to me mine. What if you haven't got one? William was thinking about himself and his mother. Mustafa shrugged. What a man thinks, or does not think, is his own business. It's what a man does in the world that counts. Mum was all right, then. She spent half her life up at the hospital, stitching up cuts and helping frightened people. He wasn't quite so sure about himself going round upsetting people. The memory of Granny's folded arms and dark face came back to William in a horrid rush. I'm not doing so well, am I? Granny was so angry, grabbing my arm and pulling me along and pushing me in here. He sighed. But now that I know what upset her, I think. I could say sorry. Mustafa sniffed. And she could usefully return the favor. What? Granny? Say sorry to me. William was amazed. Why not? Mustafa shook a finger towards the door. Gray hairs do not come woven into a halo, and no one should go poking in another's bag, looking for sins. These things are best left to God. Mustafa had a point. There were enough religions in the world, and they all cared about different things here across, there a scroll, what you ate, how you dressed, which way you faced when you were praying, words you said. You couldn't keep everyone's rules if you tried. You would always be in trouble with someone. And Granny didn't even bother to try to explain, before she lost her temper. Suddenly Mustafa seemed bored with the whole sorry business. He yawned a small cavern of mist. And another. For every believer found sitting peaceably in-house, you will find three more fighting on the steps, he said. As you will see when you are old enough to go to see. Me? Go to see. Mustafa stared. 
A sudden swirl of icy wind chilled the room. Was he annoyed? Certainly the look on his face had turned to stone. Are you a fluke, or are you not? Well, yes, I suppose I am. I'm William Fluke William broke off. Mustafa was swelling, up and out and off the sea chest towards the ceiling. The cry of gulls rang in William's ears. The floorboards heaved. There was a salt taste on his lips and, far away, he could hear the crash of surf. Filling the room with his sea mist, Mustafa roared, Am I to lie forever in this trunk? How many flukes must live and die before I see again the crescent moons and desert sands of my first days? I'll take you back, cried William. He'd promise anything. Anything to stop the sound of surf crashing on rocks, harder and harder, so any moment Granny would appear at the door. I'll take you back, I swear. If I'm a sailor, you'll see them with me. If not, I'll go and leave the bottle there. Your word on. The genie stretched down to William a clammy hand of mist. His piercing eyes were green as deepest seas, and, as if hypnotized by the sheer power of his glance, William tucked his own hands safely behind his back, and lowered his head. You have only to command me, he said simply. Mustafa laughed. The laughter echoed as he gathered himself up on his coils of mist. It turned to the harsh cry of a seabird as, with another swirl of icy wind, he spun around, pouring himself back in the bottle. Faster and faster he spun. And as the mist flowed downwards, clearing the air and emptying the room, the cry of the seabird grew fainter and fainter, more and more far away. Until, as the last wisps of green mist formed themselves into a stopper, and hardened instantly to pitted glass, the room was filled with silence. William. William turned. Granny was standing in the doorway, looking anxious. William, what was that noise? Are you all right? He looked down at the bottle, lying so harmlessly on its bed of rotten sacking. Was it the finest brocade? past its best? Was dash? Did dash? Had dash? There would be time enough. And there'd be time to keep his promise, too. Carefully, William lifted the heavy lid of the sea chest and swung it over, shutting the bottle away. He turned to face Granny. I'm sorry if what I was doing upset you. I didn't realize. I'm sorry I was so angry. I didn't think. She stretched out her arms. Gratefully, William walked towards her. She slid an arm round his shoulders as they strolled out of the room together. There was still time for cake and coffee and the game shows on television. His mother would be back later. The day was saved. As for the future, William had time to think about that. There was no need to talk about it now. After all, William found himself thinking as they walked down the hall, that's between me and Mustafa. Whatever that meant. Please subscribe my channel and encourage me to upload more videos. Like, comment, share, subscribe and press the bell icon and never miss another update.